What's up, YouTube? My name's David. And today, I'm going to show you what seven years of vocal subharmonics has done to my voice. Alright, just kidding, my voice isn't actually stuck like that, but after so many years of practice it's become really easy for me to switch between my regular voice and my subharmonic vocal register just as if it were another part of my voice. In this video I'm going to take you through the entire history of subharmonics on the internet, show you my experience with the technique, give you some tips on how you can more easily enter into the register and practice with it, and show you all some of the mystery that is still looming around subharmonics today. After seven years of basically being the epicenter of this mysterious technique, I figured it's about time for me to give you all a more high quality view of the wonderful world of subharmonics. In the spring of 2015, a young David Larson was preparing to attend an exciting camp in Dayton, Ohio called Camp Acapella. At the time, I had a pretty good grasp on my bass voice. I could sing down to a C2 on most days. This was pretty cool, but I was also trying to find other techniques I could use to sing down into the first octave. I had already been practicing aggressive phonation or inhale singing for a couple of years, but I still wasn't very consistent with it at the time. At some point in that spring though, almost exactly seven years ago from now, I was perusing YouTube and I discovered a few different videos of a guy with a seemingly baritonish type voice like mine blasting first octave notes utilizing something called subharmonics. This guy's name was Jay Fleming. I tracked him down on Facebook and sent him some messages asking, <clears throat> how, how did, you know, I asked him what this technique was and how I could do it myself. He sent me some tips and some information and I got started, but I really didn't get very far. I had no success right away. At the same time, I came across videos from Tu Yang and Cody Jeter. Eventually, after trying a few different things, something clicked and I was able to get the technique down fairly consistently. By the time summer came around, I had developed this awesome party trick to impress people with at Camp Acapella. When I got there though, I was humbled. During a group warm-up on one of the first mornings at this camp, I found myself singing bass next to a guy who could blast first octave notes basically every day. This guy's name was David Kahn. David Kahn had a very special voice and everyone could tell. This was the first time in my life I got to sing with a real bass. I don't know why I did this, he's a really, a real bass. We immediately became friends and of course at camp I introduced him to the world of subharmonics. Neither of us were very good at subharmonics at the time, but we both realized that even an average grasp of this technique could allow a singer to extend the bottom of their vocal range down an octave. We both saw the massive potential in it. At the time, there were maybe five people on the internet that could actually tell you what subharmonics were and perform them themselves. Of course, I started posting some YouTube clips of myself uh, using the subharmonic register just to show people how cool it was. So I was immediately bombarded with comments from people asking how they can do this technique themselves. I realized quickly that there was no formal tutorial online and very little information whatsoever on the subharmonic 
harmonic vocal technique. So armed with the rear camera on an iPod touch, no microphone, no computer, no editing software, and a terribly lit ugly room, actually the same room I'm in right now, I made this tutorial. It was low quality and full of mistakes, but over the years it has helped countless singers and beatboxers as well reach lows they never thought were possible. Bass singing was and still is a micro niche in the music community. However, after almost seven years of this video being online, it's almost impossible today to find a bass singer on the internet who hasn't at least heard of the existence of subharmonics. Many of these singers themselves have also dabbled with this technique out of curiosity. One of those singers being Jeff Castellucci of Voice Play. Nearly halfway ago between the release of my vocal subharmonic tutorial video and now, Voiceplay released their arrangement of Oogie Boogie's song from The Nightmare Before Christmas. The moment it was released, I had a number of friends and subscribers reaching out to me saying, Jeff used subharmonics, he must have seen your video. And after listening to the song, I agreed. He did use subharmonics for the super low E. After nearly 9 million views in two and a half years, I believe this to be the first commercially successful implementation of vocal subharmonics in music ever. So that's pretty cool. Jeff later went on to make his own tutorial video on singing low and actually credited me in my video for learning subharmonics. Now, as somebody who grew up religiously listening to voice play and pentatonics and uh, home free, this was quite a meta moment for me to say the least. Anyways, I'm still receiving comments and messages today from people trying to learn this technique, mostly from people struggling to get the hang of it. Because of that, I've realized it's probably about time I give you all a much more high quality look at this technique and where I I'm at with it today. Hey there, Editor David here. Looking kind of scruffy, to be honest. Anyways, I've given you multiple subharmonic tutorial videos before, but I figured since you're here and I'm here, it'd be a good idea for me to give you a quick little down and dirty tutorial on how to enter into the subharmonic register and how you can play with it and get started. So whether or not you've tried this technique before, or this is your very first time hearing about it and trying it, I want you to know one very important thing before you even attempt it. In no way whatsoever do you have to aim for the low pitch to make it happen. Okay. If you do this properly, it'll feel like you're singing a higher pitch, an octave above what's coming out, and the lower pitch will just magically appear. It sounds ridiculous, but that's exactly what it feels like. Okay. So I've shown you some things before on how to get into this register, but here's a new one that I haven't shown you at all. And it involves speaking to find a subharmonic register. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to find, you know, a low standard vocal fry pitch in your range. Something like try speaking down here in vocal fry. I can't do vocal fry very well because my subharmonics are too strong. Wrong. Let's speak down here in vocal fry. And then I want you to work your way up until you're in somewhere around your standard speaking voice range with the same vocal fry type quality to it. Now, what you're actually doing right now is speaking in subharmonics. What you need to do from here is add air and sustain to what you're already voicing. Like the ah, uh, ah. Uh. That's one way I've found to help people find the register. Now, your first attempts at this are probably not going to sound that good and you're not going to have very much control of it at all, but that's okay. What I want you to take from that little experiment though is to find the feeling of the placement of subharmonics. It's very similar to vocal fry, but a bit more organized. Now store that feeling up here, you know, memorize it. And I want you to take a pitch that's kind of in the median part of your lower range in regular voice and sing it. For most guys, most baritones, something like, oh, something around there. And now what I want you to do is I want you while singing that pitch to imagine your voice sliding into that organized vocal fry, not jumping down the octave like this, but sliding into it like this, okay? Um, 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 um. 
One little tip that I found that you should use while practicing is that sometimes it's easier to keep the subharmonic uh, note sustained if you have your mouth closed. I'm not really sure why, but it just is. And I found people that I'm trying to help uh, say the same thing about it. So, you know, if you're having trouble sustaining it right away with your mouth open, try closing it like this. Eventually, you should just be able to jump down to the lower octave without having to slide or transition or do any of these practice things. Something like this. Om. You see, as you'll find out, the early stages of subharmonic practice are uh, kind of annoying to most mortal humans, you know, the peasants, if you will. They just, they just don't get it, okay? So the less you can interject it into their lives, you know, the better. So a good practice that I found is actually with mouth closed, you know, to prevent exposure. Finding a, a subharmonic pitch that works well with your voice and plucking it like an electric bass, like this. And the final beginner practice that I want you to work on is changing pitch with subharmonics. It's very hard to get a big range in the subharmonic register, but it's very important. Having a range outside of just one or two notes is what allows you to fully integrate this technique into singing and beatboxing and anything else you might want to use it with. Start with your easy subharmonic pitch and just move up and down and stretch your range. Mm -hmm. um, oh. And there's your quick little subharmonic tutorial for the day. Now back to the video. One of the questions I see asked quite often is, does subharmonics hurt your voice? The answer, I don't know. This technique has not been commercially or consistently used for a long enough period of time by anybody to say for sure whether or not it is good or bad for your voice. Most people online looking for a cheat code within their own voice to sing super low notes, they just want to sing low and they don't care how hard it is to get there. But for what it's worth, here's my experience with the technique. During my first few weeks practicing with it, I do remember my voice being a little bit tired, uh, nothing crazy, but after a while, maybe after a few weeks of practicing, this fatigue completely disappeared. I I think this is equatable to how different muscle groups in your body respond to being used in new workouts for the first time. Just starting tricep dips, yeah your elbows and triceps and shoulders are going to be a little bit sore for a while. Pull ups, chin ups, lats, yeah. Bicep curls, yeah your arms, yeah. Squats, yeah. Your voice is a muscle group, albeit a delicate one in comparison. After singing subharmonics for seven years, I don't really notice any negative side effects on my voice. I have noticed some changes though. Obviously now I can pop into subharmonics and use it as a regular extension of my voice at will. But also I have way more control of the rasp in my voice. See your eyes in the morning sun Feel you touch me in the pouring rain so we fell through the door like the enemies Just one little bite of the apple of my eyes All it took, now she's my cherry pie Finally, the kitchen with her cooking up dessert So you wait for me, my evergreen Now it's just as hard and just to note, I don't smoke or drink at all, so there are very few external factors that could also cause me to have more rasp in my opinion. Not only that, but to support this observation, proper rasp technique for belting in rock and metal music is actually a form of high subharmonics in disguise. For a very famous reference of this to look at, take a listen to and read some articles on the impeccable voice of Freddie Mercury from Queen. At the same time, it's basically impossible for me to use regular vocal fry now. Every time I try, it just melts into subharmonics and I can't help it. For years, I've theorized that subharmonics are what vocal fry is naturally trying to be. It is an organized form of vocal fry. And actually, I've found that people with a strong and present vocal fry to start with have a much, much easier time finding the register and slipping into it than people that don't. Conversely, young, fresh voices do have a hard time finding this technique. It's also theorized and essentially confirmed that throughout history, I mean like hundreds of years, choral 
several octavists have used a form of the subharmonic technique to fill auditoriums with super impressive first octave low notes. Obviously, many octavists throughout history, especially Russian ones and Eastern European ones, were blasting these notes with their full voice. But a keen ear that has listened to a lot of subharmonics over the years can definitely pick out somebody using the technique. Not only has the subharmonic technique changed my voice a little bit over the years, but it has also changed my life and my perspective of the world through a scientific lens. Many people in this niche see the subharmonic technique as an octave jump, but that description alone barely scratches the surface of an infinitely deep iceberg. The subharmonic technique is not exclusive to the human voice, and actually it's not exclusive to any instrument or any thing. It is merely the result of what happens when very specific conditions are met between two sound waves, and more empirically, two waves in general. For the classic first subharmonic, the octave jump below the fundamental, you simply need a collision of two frequencies or pitches that are a perfect fifth apart. When written out as hertz, these pitches will have a ratio of 3 to 2, and in reality, the full ratio ends up being 3 to 2 to 1, the 1 being the resultant subharmonic. However, this is not the only specific ratio that will produce a subharmonic. There is actually an infinite series of subharmonics below the first. They exist in a very precise harmonic order. Hmm, don't we already have a well-documented and well-known harmonic order in music? The overtone series. I wonder if the subharmonic series is related in any way. Well, as a matter of fact, it is. The subharmonic series is the inverse of the overtone series in its order. It shares the exact same intervals between each level, but the position each subharmonic level has in relationship to the fundamentals major scale is different because the intervals are starting from the 8 and going down instead of starting from the 1 and going up. There are infinitely many subharmonics below the fundamental just as there are overtones above it. However, getting past the 4th or 5th subharmonic level is incredibly hard to do because of the mechanical difference between how subharmonics are activated and how overtones are amplified. Overtones are always there. Using a few tricks with your tongue and soft palate, you can sweep through different resonant frequency shapes in your mouth and probably find around a half dozen overtones pretty easily like this. It's always fun. Subharmonics are different though. They aren't always there like how overtones are. You have to create the conditions necessary for them to exist. There is some debate about how we're able to do this with the human voice. But before I tell you why, I need to show you how subharmonics are created outside the human voice first. So you can do this with basically any two instruments or sources of sound, but one of the best ways to demonstrate subharmonics outside the human vocal technique is by using your voice and a harmonica. And actually you can do this with just the harmonica by itself as well. Check this out. Harmonicas are diatonic instruments, and this one is a chromatic, it's a special harmonica, but it's in the key of C to start with. So the first three below notes are C, E, G, which will give us the, the triad for the C major chord. But if you block off the middle, you will just get an open fifth, a C and a G, which is the recipe for the first subharmonic. Check this out. <laughs> The really cool thing about using a harmonica for this is that you can feel the subharmonic vibrate through your skull. It's really awesome. And now let's spice things up a little bit. Now I'm going to use the C on the harmonica for the fundamental pitch of this subharmonic series. And at the same time, I'm going to sing with my voice to create the other part of the ratio necessary for different subharmonic levels. We're going to start with the first subharmonic and work our way down until we get to a point that you'll notice I have a hard time splitting pitches. <laughs>
hopefully you can hear those subharmonics really well. I can feel them really well in my face as I'm blowing into this harmonica. It is such a cool thing to play with. If you have a harmonica, it doesn't have to be a fancy one like this. Um, just any simple diatonic harmonica will do. Go ahead and play with this a little bit and you'll find a bunch of different uh, harmonic ratios that work to create subharmonics. Okay, continuing on. You can take virtually any two sources of sound, two similar or different instruments that produce a pitch, and combine their sounds together to make subharmonic pitches. This is why in some realms, subharmonics are referred to as resultant tones or combination tones. A subharmonic is not a pitch that can be created from one sound alone. It's a baby. It takes two. A subharmonic is the result of two waves crashing into each other perfectly. The sub pitch you hear is actually the point at which the waves cross the origin at the same time. It's merely a consistent disruption of space. That is the sub you're hearing. It's not a new fundamental and actually it's somewhat of an audio illusion. To segue for a brief moment, not only can subharmonics be heard, but they can be seen as well. They are truly byproducts of waves playing nicely together. Even physical waves like drops in a pond can create subharmonics. Scenarios like this make me question what really is sound, but I think I'll save that topic for another video. Circling back to how the human voice produces subharmonics, the leading theory is that the two regular vocal folds are vibrating at two different rates at the same time when you're activating the technique. This makes sense to me as everywhere outside the human voice, it takes two separate pitches to create a subharmonic. However, I don't know for certain whether this theory is 100% true or not because I've also heard another theory involving pressure and harmonic distortion between the vocal folds. So, wait, if there are infinitely many subharmonics below the fundamental, how do we reach them? Like this. It's hard to describe the feeling between resting on the first subharmonic and jumping to the second or third. It doesn't require any movement of your larynx or your mouth to switch levels at all. It must be a very precise muscle control right around the vocal folds, but I guess I'm not really sure what it is. Once you find the feeling between switching levels, which took me years to be honest, it's something you never forget how to do. At the same time, it's still a bit of a mystery to me. It feels just as innate and natural as moving from pitch to pitch in my regular voice, even though it's an entirely different mechanic altogether. When jumping between subharmonic levels, you're actually not changing your fundamental pitch at all. It's staying the same. And that mechanic is exactly why it's very hard as humans to get past the fourth or fifth subharmonic with our voice. Even if you're starting at a C4 fundamental, your fifth subharmonic will be all the way down at an F1. Now it's very hard for the human voice to keep pitches below the first octave stable, even using the subharmonic technique. Nevertheless, for me, using the second or third subharmonic is incredibly useful as it allows me to easily sing first octave notes with lots of volume and presence and control and even vibrato while actually singing and placing the fundamental somewhere up in the third octave. My initial drive for wanting to learn subharmonics was to become a powerful bass in a choral setting. But after years of growth, I found that subharmonics is also finding a potentially powerful position in the beatboxing community alongside throat bass and other super bass techniques. Although it uses different mechanics by activating the false folds in conjunction with the regular vocal folds, throat bass variants are in fact subharmonic techniques as well. Throat bass is the first subharmonic in its series. Vibration bass is based off the same fundamental as throat bass. It is the second subharmonic in that series. Yo, I'm working on a really nerdy video <laughs> dealing with like subharmonics. Um, do you think you could send me a, like a little clip of you singing a vibration bass?
The reason vibration bass is so thick and heavy sounding is because it essentially is a power chord. The first two subharmonics stack on top of each other and the lowest of the two appears audibly as the dominant tonic in that chord. That sounds like this. It's cool that you say that because many people tell me that my vibration bass has a really noticeable a regular voice in it and I also see that many vibration basses don't really have that so since I learned the sound I always try to focus on making my regular voice hearable because that makes it easier to control the pitch in my opinion and yeah my biggest goal always is making the regular voice uh, shine through, but keeping the sub. Big shout out to my friend Tattle. Thank you for those clips. Anyways, this perfect fifth stacking is actually exactly how sub heavy trap 808s are made. They get their thickness from the resultant tone of this perfect fifth stack, the subharmonic. The more you learn about subharmonics, the more you realize they are everywhere. And that aspect has changed my life and how I view different subjects like sound. After seven years, I've learned a lot about this technique and the science behind why it's so cool. At the same time, one question still lingers for me. Why? Mathematically, it makes sense why subharmonics occur. Precise ratios of waves dancing together will always produce a harmonic result. But why does the human voice have these ratios locked into place as if they're supposed to be there? Throat based variants are a forced technique. The approach required isn't intentionally precise like it's mathematically perfect nature. You aren't actively telling your false folds to vibrate a fifth above your regular folds in order to create a throat based subharmonic, but that's what they're doing. You're just sort of pushing and constricting to make this happen. Likewise with regular subharmonics, they're more delicate, but the ideology is the same. I'm not actively making my vocal folds vibrate at precisely different rates to jump between different subharmonic levels. Sure, I'm making micro adjustments to the muscles around my vocal folds to make something like this happen, but those ratios are finding each other and locking themselves into place without question, as if it's their only choice. These subharmonic techniques are not intentional modulations of the different folds to find different ratios that work. These ratios are preset into our voices. Now, there are a few polyphonic vocal techniques that truly allow you to independently vary each pitch, but subharmonics are not one of them. They're bound by the mathematically perfect intervals and ratios that make up the harmonic series. Why are these preset chords here, here, in our throats? I don't know, but I would love to hear what you think about that question. And seriously, I mean like, go off. I love reading paragraphs in the comments from people covering subjects that I'm trying to learn more about that I don't know a whole lot about in the first place. This is one of the beautiful aspects of the internet and YouTube in specific. If you know a bit about a subject, but you want to learn even more, make a video about it. That's pretty much how I got here today. Aside from all the trolls and kids and negativity that makes up comment sections sometimes, there are actually a lot of smart people online, on YouTube and on social media. And I'm really happy when you guys open your mouths because you have a lot of good things to say. So uh, yeah, go ahead and say them. I hope you enjoyed this video. And if you did, please give it a like and subscribe to my channel as it would motivate me to make more videos like this more often instead of spending evenings laying in my bed watching cinematic Rust movies, which by the way, are really well done and thoroughly enjoyable. Anyways, thank you all for watching. Watching, and as always, until next time.